Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. I have already experienced in Morosovsk several divisions in fleeing retreat losing their whole stores, even their field kitchens, and having to go hungry for several days. That is how it is, therefore soon after his arrival in the cauldron, Paulus ordered all units to report the precise state of their rations, clothing, ammunition and fuel stocks. Quartermasters and managers were ordered to ensure even distribution. I do not know if all have reported back honorably and truthfully. We cannot check all the reports. We must thus assume that most of the encircled army troops have been hungry for days. The lack of supplies worsens every 24 hours in direct correlation to the smaller number of machines flying in. Where is the way out, Elchlep? The way out lies in continuous, maximum possible air supply and in the success of Operation Hoff. Neither of us believes in the reality of the air bridge. Whether Hoff's army will succeed in forming a land bridge to us appears to me also as very uncertain. But are we not falling into an unhealthy self-deception? Naturally a big question mark lies behind both assumptions, but we too are not idle. Although Hitler has ordered Stalingrad to be held, we have made all preparations to be able to thrust towards the Hoth army in the next few days. We cannot give up faith in success. This general staff officer, Colonel Elchlep, was a one in 10,000 honorably believing officers and soldiers. Their loyalty rested in their trust in the high command, for which they were ready to risk their lives, and they were also firmly convinced that their trust with deeds and decisions was in accordance with their responsibility. Trust for responsibility, responsibility for trust, that certainly was the formula to which military thinking and dealing conformed. Brought up in this spirit, most of us lived and fought by this principle. What, however, if the high command misused this trust, so that this responsibility on whatever grounds, perhaps even carelessly, was illegal? This doubt nagged at me, this obvious belief, this unshakable trust in the responsibility of the Wehrmacht command was strongly embedded in me. The formal trust regarding responsibility, responsibility versus trust, seemed questionable to me, simplified, somewhat naive after the bitter disillusionments of the last weeks. Might not General von Seidlitz be right, for the moment I went on with other everyday matters. I have yet another question, Elchlep. Can we look after the wounded and sick, especially the badly injured, in orderly fashion? Unfortunately not, you know that all the big hospitals lie west of the Don. There are a few field hospitals on the edge of the city and in the steppe. These have long since been overflowing, although we pack every returning aircraft with badly wounded. It's not only places that are lacking, but especially dressings, narcotics, medicines, surgical equipment. The supply is minimal, doctors and medical staff are vastly overworked and are falling out in growing numbers. Army doctors and quartermasters can tell you all about that. The conversation with the IA had made me wiser, but not more comfortable. I made my way to my office in the commander-in-chief's dugout. Only a few courier post items were there. While I was giving Senior Sergeant Major Cupper instructions to deal with, the door opened and Paulus entered. Much work, Adam? Nothing worth mentioning, General, some recommendations for the Knight's Cross and the German Cross in gold have been approved. I will pass them straight on to the Corps. A Knight's Cross for a lost battle, comical, don't you think? Paulus smiled and then went on, you were at the Corps headquarters this morning, is there anything new there? No, General, or actually, yes, there was something new for me. The Corps adjutant told me that some of the divisions on the northern and eastern fronts of the cauldron are backing General Sadlitz, I did not know that. Paulus nodded his head lightly and spoke in a somewhat lower voice. Yes, that is how Hitler's radio message went. You can read it later at my office, I myself do not know what it means. It could be that Hitler is testing whether Sadlitz really has the courage to go against a Fuhrer order. It could also be that Sadlitz stands high in Hitler's estimation. I don't understand it, General, on one side Hitler says he is leaving things to the commander-in-chief of the 6th Army. A day later he places most of the divisions under General Sadlitz. But that is a contradiction, especially as Sadlitz has requested freedom of action despite the Fuhrer order. What does he really mean now at this point? 
I asked him about it in the presence of General Strecker. He answered me with, under the circumstances, I must naturally obey. Come with me, I will show you Hitler's radio message. In his office Paulus took a sheet of paper from his briefcase and handed it to me. I read the following sentences signed below by Hitler, breakout out of the question, supply by air assured, new army is being assembled under General Hoth for opening up the cauldron. All divisions on the Volga and Northern Front come under the command of General Seidlitz. A supplement noted that General Paulus retained responsibility for the general command of the surrounded troops. Later, when I was alone again, I had time to think about the paulus Seidlitz relationship. Two opposing characters, Paulus, the knowledgeable, careful general staff officer, the thinker, but also the hesitant one. Seidlitz, much less well-trained and knowledgeable than Paulus, but nevertheless a decisive daredevil. Seidlitz, in also having his own opinion regarding Paulus's frank presentation, was defiant in contrast to the other generals. Hitler's order with the personal distinction of giving him higher powers of command had also turned him silent. General von Seidlitz too obeyed, despite his divergence of opinion. How often, as the army adjutant, had I been able to observe how higher positions, promotions and higher decorations at least influenced the behavior of several officers? How they were linked through thinking and dealing in selected ways, even Seidlitz had given up. The days after the December 12th were especially exciting, Army headquarters prepared the breakout. Operation Hoth had the codeword Winter Storm. With thunderclap the 6th Army would break out of the ring and march towards Hoth. It was planned that we would take out all the wounded on trucks. If only the food supplies were better. Of food supplies, fuel and ammunition up to the December 12th per day on average not once was 100 tons flown in. In response to the incessant call for help from the army there was a slight increase thereafter, but even then the minimum request of 300 tons was not attained by far. Hunger increased and bored even deeper into the bowels of the surrounded. The number of those debilitated through hunger already exceeded the number of wounded. In every bunker, in every trench, at every main dressing station lay wasted soldiers and officers no longer able to stand on their feet. In this emergency situation the army took back the horses of the Romanian cavalry division that were already half dead from lack of fodder. The army quartermaster, Captain Topke, gave 4,000 horses up for slaughter. Their flesh and bones enabled the rations to be improved at least temporarily. Not much was gained, however, as on the December 15th the bread ration had to be reduced to 100 grams. Two slices of bread per day, a thin soup of horse flesh and some cups of herb tea or malt tea was what the soldier had to fight and live on, and withstand frost, snow and storm. Understandably, the quarter million encircled men fervently awaited Hoth's approaching army. With the arrival of the 4th Panzer Army a wave of relief, returning self-confidence and a new will to resist swept through the cauldron. Holding on seemed to make sense once more. A few days more and the deadly surrounding ring could be prized open. The high morale lasted two or three days, but then, as day after day stretched into futile waiting, shattering disappointment and bitter resignation took over. General Paulus drove every morning to the division standing at the critical point of the battle. Early in the morning of the December 16th, the thermometer was below minus 30 degrees as he set out for the hard-threatened western front of the cauldron. When he returned towards midday he looked as if he had experienced something serious. You were at the 44th Infantry Division today, General. According to yesterday's evening report they have had large losses, have the Russians attacked again? You know that there is constant simmering in this sector. But the casualties from combat are not the worst. The divisional commander and divisional doctor report ever more cases of severe freezing in recent days. Without adequate winter clothing the soldiers in their holes in the snow are unprotected from the ice-cold steppe winds. By day they cannot leave their trenches and holes to perform their necessary functions at all. When they try to, most of them have to pay with their lives. There is none that can rest in their narrow holes, inevitably they freeze. How can the wounded and sick be removed from the front lines? That is just about an insoluble problem, the enemy fires at any movement. Only with the arrival of darkness can the wounded be carried off and the frozen treated. That means too often that the medical assistance comes too late. Yesterday an orderly officer from the 44th division was here. 
He said that at night on both sides the fighting comes to an almost complete stop. We only leave weak security in the positions. Is there at least time for the possibility of providing accommodation for the resting troops, General? The few settlements on the steppe were strongly shot up by us in the summer, and now, by the enemy. There are some bunkers among the ruins, mostly constructed by our rear services in the autumn. They are partly occupied by staff, they are naturally far too few. During the night everyone gathers around the fires and stoves. The firewood has to be brought with difficulty from Stalingrad. What will happen then when the fighting strength of the divisions sinks further at this pace? How will the front continue to hold out? It is imperative that we soon have a connection with the outside world. But tell me, Adam, what suggestions can you make to me? Paulus went off to see Schmidt, I went to my office, taking the divisional and army unit figures with me. The tank and artillery units that had lost their tanks or guns were already disbanded, those of their officers and men who were still fit for fighting being deployed as infantry. One could still comb the rear services and the higher staff, whose work was diminishing. Also officers and soldiers were being released from our divisions in the city to reinforce the endangered sectors of the front. I proposed speaking to Schmidt about it at the next opportunity. While I was still going through this, an orderly entered and asked me to attend a conference in the chief of staff's room. General Paulus and Elchlep were already present. Major General Schmidt was standing in front of the situation map. At a wave from the commander-in-chief he reported, I have just now spoken with the chief of staff of Army Group Don, General Schultz, by the decimeter apparatus. He told me that early today the Red Army went into the attack against the left flank of Army Group Don and the right wing of Army Group B. Apparently, the enemy has the intention of breaking through towards Rostov. The situation at the moment is unclear. The 14th Panzer Corps of Hoth's army is engaged in bitter fighting with strong enemy forces and is advancing only slowly. Its foremost elements are struggling near Verchinkumsky, Vershiansky and Krugliokov, which means about 50 kilometers from the southern front of our cauldron. Army Group Don has been tasked by the Army High Command to assist the 6th Army in breaking out of its encirclement. We must reckon that in this exceptionally critical situation the Army High Command has at last shown some consideration. I ask the IA and the Quartermaster to report on the state of our preparations. The voice of our Chief of Staff trembled somewhat excitedly, but by the end of his presentation it was sure and firm again. The IA said, our 40 or 50 still serviceable tanks are gathered near the ordered breakthrough point. The fuel supplies are sufficient for at least 30 kilometers. The commanding general of the Panzer Corps has been given the task of breaking through the enemy defense lines and establishing contact with the 14th Panzer Corps. The breakthrough point is to be secured on either side so that the 6th Army can slip through. The withdrawal of our divisions is ready on all fronts. Then the deputy senior quartermaster, Lieutenant Colonel von Konoski, reported, Captain Topki is in Karpovka, as ordered. He has assembled their trucks with a load capacity of 700 tons, with which he will follow our attacking tanks. His task is to take over the supplies from the Hoth Army and to drive as quickly as possible to our advancing divisions. The 8th Air Corps has orders to drop fuel and ammunition to the tanks thrusting south. Guns and field kitchens will be towed by the trucks. The necessary number is ready. Schmidt now remarked that all superfluous apparatus should be prepared for destruction. Paulus was looking at the map during this report. Now he turned around to us, hopefully the order will come very soon, or there will be the danger of us not being able to carry it out anymore. Every day gnaws at the strength of our soldiers, reduces our food supplies, ammunition, fuel and medical supplies. Today there is still sufficient fuel for a 30-kilometer attack, but in four or five days our reserves will have shrunk to the extent that we will no longer be capable of carrying out an attack. After this most serious, although not so surprising, appraisal of the situation, we were dismissed. Naturally the measures taken by the troops in the Karpovka area could not remain concealed. The simple soldier in these respects was especially alert. Just as the slowness of the advance of the Hoth army brought a certain depression, so the news of an impending breakout spread with the speed of the wind, bringing new optimism. The simple soldiers just wanted to forget the stresses and victims of the past weeks if they got out of this mousetrap. 
Breaking out of the cauldron meant regular and sufficient supplies, release from the fighting front, rest and long overdue leave, seeing wives and children, parents and relations. What illusions these overexcited, fought out, emaciated soldiers had. Our clerks and orderlies beamed in expectation of the forthcoming change of luck. They no longer sat apathetic and indifferent at their desks. When towards evening on the December 16th I went to see my clerks in their dugout, I found Senior Sergeant Major Cupper smiling. It will soon be over, Colonel, how we will celebrate when we get out of this damned hole again. Those at home don't know anything about how it is with us. Only yesterday I had a letter from my wife in which she asked for at least the tenth time when I was coming on leave. You lucky chap. I, dear Cupper, have heard nothing from my family since the November 19th. But one can only hope, prepare for me all the paper rubbish that you have collected for destruction. We will not encumber ourselves with it in our breakout. Already done, Colonel, just now there was a clerk from the Corps here. According to what he said, General von Seidlitz is setting a good example. He has literally burnt everything, uniforms, underwear, boots, camera, books, and retained only those things that he can carry on himself. I had to laugh. That was Seidlitz, temperamental and basic, and no friend of half measures. This was only a small part of Arno von Lenski's memories. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, also do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel see you all soon for now.